Okay, this is Minjoo Chen. This is a video lecture on uh, the second video lecture on system development life cycle. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the challenge in terms of managing software project. And, and first of all, um, this is what we usually refer to as a triple constraint in project in project management in general, not just for software. Um, there are three constraints. The first one is the resource that you may have, uh, which translate into your cost. The resource may be particularly related to the um, human resources, uh, the developer, the system analyst that you may need to hire to work on your project. The second constraint is uh, your schedule. Um, or which is the time constraint, uh, when the project has to be finished. The third constraint is your project's scope. Scope is kind of part of your requirement. The more requirement you have, the larger the scope. And, and, the, and quality certainly will be part of the scope. Uh, some people put quality in the middle here. Um, referring to it, it's independent from the scope, but uh, some people put it together. And they, they are, um, this three constraint depends on each other, okay? For instance, if you want to uh, speed up your project, make it shorter, okay? You want to finish in a shorter time, what can you do? If your boss say, hey, instead of um, end of August, I want this get done in end of July. What can you do in order to speed it up? If this has to be cut, make it faster, then you need to look at the other two constraints. What will be the typical reaction that you may have if you're a project manager and answering your boss request of speed up your project? Yet, you give me more people, right? Uh, double my manpower, and maybe I can speed it up. That's one. How about on this side? Quality suffers. Um, in quality may suffer. May. Or? No, scope. scope, how about scope? If you want it, I cannot guarantee top quality, okay? How about scope? if you want to speed it up. Scope can be expanded and can be, yeah. can be cut. Yeah. Let, let, let's reduce the scope, right? If you want it by end of July, I can give you the following function, but not that one, okay? So it's a little bit give and take. If you know the constraint, then you, you, you know how to negotiate with your stakeholder, with your sponsor, okay? And until then, they are implication in terms of changing any one of the three constraints. So for the triple constraint, if you're going between cost or resource or schedule or time, mm -hmm. like, do you have to pick either one of those, or are they both kind of like together? And the question here is cost and resources, schedule and time. They, they are pretty much re referring to the same thing. Okay, cost, the resource imply your cost structure. Uh, the time constraint would, uh, would have impact to your schedule. So they are pretty much the same thing. Some people use the term time, some people use the term schedule. Okay. So just keep that in mind. And earlier, um, some, some of you suggest that we can double the manpower Okay, I uh, apologize for me to use the term manpower. Should say people power, human power, not manpower. Woman is part of the um, important element of our workforce. Okay, but here, once again, um, I'm referring to a book, don't blame me, okay, <laughs> called The Mythical Man Month, okay, uh, or Mythical Woman Month, okay, or Mythical Person Month. Okay, I, I'm still just use the men month because it's a kind of popular term uh, in the software industry. Um, it, it's actually a title of a book um, uh, by Fred 
books uh, who used to be uh, IBM System um, 360, uh, a mainframe, very successful mainframe computers uh, project manager. He wrote the book based on his experience of managing this humongous uh, project, huge project. And if you're interested in, uh, I recommend you actually to get a copy of the book. Uh, this, this link is a link to, uh, I think, chapter two of the book, specifically talking about um, system scheduling issue and the trade-off between human resource and the schedule. Okay, one of the two constraints. Okay, and this is the time on the vertical dimension on the horizontal axis. Uh, it's the manpower. Okay, so the curve here, this curve here, okay, is the ideal situation when there's no communication will be required among the people working on the same project, okay? <coughs> okay. This communication implies coordination, dependency, communication, okay? And give you an example, if you, we have to mount the loan of the whole university, you can hire one guy, spend the whole month working on it. You can hire 30 people, each work a whole day on the same day and finish off, okay? So someone will do this Smith Center long, um, Smith Center, Sage Hall, whatever. They, in, in this case, they may not, uh, in the ideal case, they, they don't really need to coordinate that much. Someone just say, you, you're responsible for this area, just do it, okay? When you work on this one, you don't have to talk to someone else on the other part of the campus and say, how are you doing? I mean, you don't really need to communicate. Got it? Other than you get the instruction, do this. Okay. Uh, so this, this is the ideal situation. Okay. Um, but in a lot of software or major project, it doesn't work this way. Uh, in, in the worst case scenario, this is what happened. Give you more people, doesn't save you any time at all. How could that happen? In this case, it imply, okay, the job or the project that you have, the task you have are unpartitionable, which means, I'll give you a real example. When I was working on my PhD dissertation, my advisor really liked my project, okay, Dr. Jay Nunamaker. So Jay asked me probably more than once and said, if you want someone to help you with your project, I, I can assign some master student or even some new PhD student to help you out in terms of programming, etc." And I thought about it and eventually, I mean, it's very nice and, and very supported by my advisor. I really appreciate it to this day. And, but, but I said, I thought about it and I said, um, thank you, but no thanks. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't need anybody. Not that I don't need help, but I don't know how to carve out what I'm working on to give it to someone to work on a piece of it for me. It's just because I was using Smalltalk as a programming environment. It's a very individualized programming environment. It's very difficult to say, hey, write that subroutine or module for me and then I can use it. Okay, and also not many people out there know the programming language itself. So, so I actually have to spend time to train them and then have a hard time carving out what I'm working on to them. Okay, so, so that's a situation like this, okay. I mean, getting more people doesn't help at all. Okay, and in, in the in the practical sense, uh, in a lot of situations, this is what happened, okay, this diagram. And if you compare this two diagram, this one, the previous slide here, and this one, it, it looks similar, but the ideal case run this way. This is ideal case. So that's the difference, okay. The gap here means 
additional. If I add more people, supposedly, ideally, I should reduce the time up to here. But in reality, I am speed things up, but not as much as in the ideal case. What happened? There's additional overhead, more meeting, more coordination, more communication, or people get in the way of each other. Okay, because you have many tasks you need to work on by this many people, and I don't know when you have seen a TV program called is it called Extreme Makeover, something like that. They went and and tear down the house and then have like a crew of sometime a hundred coming and try to rebuild the house. Right? Is this still a program like that now? Okay. Nobody watched them. Okay, good. And in in that case, just because you have that many people doesn't mean that you you can really speed it up as much as you want it to be, because for instance, the foundation has to be done first before you can put up the frame right of the house, and then the roof you cannot put up the roof until you got everything else done, okay, and when you try to paint you have to have the have to prime it and then you paint it and let it dry and then you do the flooring um, probably you want to, I don't know do you do the flooring first before you do the painting of the wall or the other way around okay um, but you need to think about the sequence like which one is better okay if you first do the flooring and then when you do the painting the, the paint may drop on the floor and and that's not good okay but if you do the painting first and when you do the flooring, there may be a lot of dust, which may actually make your wall dirty. Okay, so it's no not a win-win situation either. So, but you need to think about those dependency, and and so so sometimes people just have to be idle. Okay, so the, which means you don't have to hire a hundred people. You may need to use a hundred people, but you don't need to use it all the time from beginning to end. You use it when they're needed. Okay. Um, so so that. This is a situation that um, it's the tasks are partitionable, but there's some overhead, which means requires some coordination, communication. Got it? And that's where you're not achieving this ideal improvement here. Okay? This is not too bad. If you're thinking about this bad, let me show you what's really considered bad. Here. What happened here? Before we talk about this, let's um, show. Let me show you this little sidebar here. If you have two people working on the same project, then you have interface. Two interface. A have an interface to B. B have an interface to A. I mean, we, we can call that one interface. Um, probably this should be one interface. I think that's a typo. Okay, just found a typo. Okay. And not mine. Um, got it from the web. Don't trust everything from the web. Okay. Three people. They need to talk with each other. So three interface. It's correct, right? Four people. Six interface. Potentially six interface. Okay. There's more people you need to deal with, um, and together the six interface. I mean, certainly for one individual, there's. There's like three other people you need to deal with, okay? But together, it's six interface. Five, we have 10 inter interface. Six people, we have 15 interface, okay? Okay. And so um, this is basically what we have. And this is actually s some combination. It's Phi one plus two that's equal to three times phi and equal to fifteen. Right? Simple math. Okay. And anyway, when you have more interface, you need to spend time to coordinate, communicate, and manage this group of people. And, and the more people you have, the more interface. Um, that you're dealing with, so up to a point, your productivity suffer. Okay, I keep increase my 
team member size, which I am gaining some, I have some productivity gain. But up to some critical point, you find out that adding more people doesn't help anymore. Not only it doesn't help, it hurts your productivity. Okay, because when you have more people, there's more politics, there's more meeting. Some people may not be familiar with the project, which need to be trained, to be bring online, and it's extra time for train them, etc. Okay, and so. That's why in a lot of um, places, they are promoting um, smaller project team instead of a large project team. Okay, a lot of very successful software product has been developed by very very few, very talented um, people working in team and work nicely within the team. Got it. So this is actually if you, this is actually reflected. Here, this critical point is reflected somewhere here. Okay, you are gaining some benefit in terms of improved productivity by cutting down the time that's required to finish the project by adding more people. But up to a point, you find out people are getting in the way of each other, and then it takes even longer time. That's why adding more people does not always mean it's a solution to speed up your project. Okay, they can be helpful up to a point. Okay, you have to find out what's what's the optimum number of people to be added to your project if you want to speed it up. Got it? Okay, so I strongly recommend you to read uh, from the this slide. Try to download this. Um, Chapter two of the book titled "The Mythical Man Month." Okay, the book has been out for almost probably thirty years by now. They they do publish、uh, a version, maybe called twenty fifth anniversary edition, with some revision. It, it's it's very rare that computer books、um, are still kind of.、Um, Read by people out there after twenty years,、um, after it being published. Okay, so so this is really not about any technology. It's about actually managing technology-based project or managing large complex project in general. So we call this、um, the Brooks Law. Okay, Fred Brooks, which is the author of the book title. On、uh, the mythical man month, okay, it's really about project management,、okay. and the law stated adding developer to a late project will make it later. Okay, it's not going to help. Okay, and Dibbers again. Okay, how long will your project、uh, take if I add two people? See, add one month. Okay, which means take. One more month for training, one month for extra complexity, and one month for dealing with their drama. Okay, actually it means together, it will be delayed by three months. Okay, and say, but after all of that, you uh, they will be as useful as this meeting, which means you you attend a lot of、um, unproductive meeting because too many people are involved. You have to meet to resolve some of the difference. So the challenge,、uh, based on that discussion,、uh, you find out、uh, Fred Brook used the term partitionable tasks. Okay, unpartitionable tasks. Okay, what does that mean? It means that when you're dealing with a large scale project, you do have many tasks that you need to work on. Okay, and in order to have many people working on it. Okay, we do need more people to work on large scale project. You don't want to say,、oh, okay, I mean, I learned from that mythical man months. Adding more people doesn't help, so I'm going to work on this by myself. Okay, and then it will be take too long for you to finish. But when you have many people working on a project, you do need to take a so called divide and conquer approach. Divide and conquer. Divide the 
whole project up into smaller tasks, divide the whole systems up into smaller modules. Okay. And if you don't know how to divide, you cannot conquer those components, those modules, and those tasks. Okay. So who is going to be the divider? The, the person in charge of dividing things up. Okay. That's usually a system architect. From a software viewpoint, it's a system architect. From a project management viewpoint, it's the project manager. Okay. Divided up the task. But in terms of software development, you need to have someone who can, who can kind of visualize how the system can be divided up into user interface component, database access component, business logic component, security element. They, they can actually uh, be able to identify different module. And then you can assign people working on different module as an individual task. Got it? OK. Uh, if you don't know how to divide, it, you cannot conquer something with, with uh, more than one person. Okay. And so how to divide things up? There's a set of criteria that we use uh, for software design. And the criteria is what we call coupling and cohesion, which I will explain. Okay, this is very important. Make sure you understand what they mean. But let me um, first introduce another concept, which is also a very important one called modularization. Module. Okay. Modularization means create module, a good, um, well-designed software module are simple and also have very stable and clearly defined interface. Remember, we used the term interface earlier, right? You have three people, then you have um, six interface. Okay. For software module, they also a concept of interface. Like, if I do this, after I have done this, what do I need to return it to you? What do you need to send it to me for me to do my job? If I'm done with this module, what should I send it back to you? And that's the interface we're talking about. You want to have a clear defined interface. You want those interface to be very stable, which means even I'm, I'm changing how I design this module, but the interfaces stay the same. You don't have to worry about it. If you want to use this module, as long as you know you're going to send me those parameter, I'm going to return this parameter back to you, you'll be fine. Okay. Even I'm changing how I implement the module. Got it? So interface is how people would talk to you and without understanding what internally you're doing your own things okay and and that this is what i'm saying you, there's no need to understand the internal structure and design of the module in order to use it people people who use the modules rely on its interface to communicate with it so you want the interface to be simple stable and clearly defined got it okay this is kind of a software design okay just like you're working on your group project and each one of you may be working on different piece and eventually they don't really need to know how you implement that piece but they you say if i call you to do this job i just need to give you this number or string and then you can deliver this the following things for me okay that's a clear defined interface and that then the the module is considered um, well defined got it so let's just use a more abstract case um, to illustrate the concept. Let's assume the blue dots here that you're seeing, I have eight of them, represent a piece of module, a module or a piece of um, software component that I need to implement. The line connecting them are the interfaces. Got it? Let's assume all the interfaces are equally in complexity. They are equally complex. Okay. Um, and then as a software designer, as a system architect, you, you are asked to divide this A module, 
somehow we, we already identified this A module. So your job now is to divide it up into two subsystems. Got it? Cut it in half. Part one and part, I mean, um, subsystem one and two. You want to give one subsystem one to one team and subsystem two to give to another team. And you want those two subsystems to be um, to be equal in terms of the effort required to implement it. Got it? That's the assumption. Okay. Assume each of the module are equal in terms of complexity. The interface among them are equal in terms of its complexity. So the question is, how should I make the cut? Yes, I, I have this dotted line indicating where you cut it. Okay. Okay, some say you cut it in B, D, D as David. Yes. Okay, some want to cut it. Anybody want to vote for B as a boy? Okay. What's the difference? You all divided into four and four, right? Why D is better? Yes, very good. D only cuts through one line. By comparison, B cut through one, two, three, four. Which means I have four interfaces I need to manage by working with another project sub team. Okay? To make sure they 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 will work, I mean they will match. If you cut it here, that means this people working on this and working on this, they only need to deal with and talk when in the meeting they just say, hey, for that interface, let's just call this X, interface X, okay? Have you done it? What is that? And this is what I'm going to give it to you. This is what you're going to uh, return it back to me. Uh, inside what you're going to work on, how you're going to connect this module inside, uh, it's irrelevant to the other part, the other team working on the other subsystem. Got it? So you have a very clear and well-defined interface, on only one interface instead of four. Okay. So where you cut it, it's very important. Okay. And certainly, it's more complicated than this. A lot of time we have a lot of things. We have a laundry list of things we need to do. Eventually you need to group certain things together and say, oh, that's a module. This you say, oh, that has to be done and we'll make it this as a module. Okay. So you, you have a lot of little things, tasks you have to do and eventually, um, or functionality you have to implement. So you start to group things into module. Okay. And then you start defining their interface, and eventually, visually, you have something like this. And that's when you're ready to start to decide how you're going to divide, and then conquer. Yes. When it says eye cohesion, mm -hmm. it's talking about the items on that list, how well they go together. Very good question. The question is about what do I mean in terms of high cohesion and low coupling? Let me explain low coupling, which is actually pretty much explained already. Low coupling means the interface is very simple, low coupling. Okay, we're not strongly related to each other. So we can kind of meet occasionally, just make sure we're, we're in sync with each other. High coupling means that it's very, we're in, interwine with each other so we have constantly kind of try to entangle those complex interface that's high coupling okay we want low coupling between or among modules okay but what does cohesion mean cohesion means just like here i got a list of things so there's three things i need to do i decided to put it together into this module those three things um, are highly, um, they're, they're kind of related to each other. It's so like in the morning you get up, you want to wash your face, brush your teeth, eat your breakfast. Okay, you want to do that in sequence, in that sequence, right? And maybe brush your teeth again, okay, when you finish your breakfast. But anyway, those are the morning things, right? So it's a morning module, morning activity module, okay? It makes sense to, to group them together. 
okay, um, because they are highly cohesive in terms of a time sequence, okay, and so whatever component that you need to, that you need to finish or function you need to finish, when they are closely related to each, to each other, then you group them together into a module, then they will be considered highly cohesive. They have high cohesion. That module has high cohesion, which means the module, the component, the things that you have to do inside that module are highly cohesive. When you have highly cohesive module, usually that means the coupling among the module will be less complex. Okay, so usually you, you want to have this low coupling and high cohesion um, um, in, in your software design. So the high cohesiveness we're describing within the module, the component within the module need to be highly related to each other. You want to group them together because they need to constantly talking to each other, working with each other to get things done. Try to separate them. Uh, eventually you're going to create much complex interface. Okay, I give you an example not in software. Um, the, um, for instance, we, um, uh, my office is in Sage Hall, business school is in Sage Hall. And extended university or extended education is also at Sage Hall. We used to have history program, sociology program, political science programs, professor um, also in Sage Hall. And we have a new office building just finished probably um, a year ago. And, um, and at that time, t um, the university pretty much decided how some of them will be uh, reallocated or moved to that, um, do you call it North Hall or um, to, to the new building, okay? And, and certainly, personally, I may want to move to the new building because my current office, the window won't open. Okay, I cannot, I, even I stand up, I can only, st I mean, my window is much higher than I am, so I cannot really look out my window, okay? Uh, if you know office politics, not politics, office, um, in a good office is a good office with a good view, okay? Size does matter, but good view is, is actually sometimes even more important, okay? And um, anyway, but, um, our, our um, AVP of business school, um, Professor Cordero and um, Dr. T um, Gary Burke uh, from the extended air, they, we work closely because our MBA program, some of the program in Santa Barbara um, are all through the extended air. Um, we need constantly talking to each other. So one thing they um, they pretty much stated up front and say, we don't really care we're moving or not. We want to stay with the business school and extended ad, want to stay together. Okay. Which means we, if you're thinking about bigger module, they, they treat this two unit as a bigger module. They want it to be together because inside that module, there's a lot of cohesiveness. If you divide it up, physically separate them, and sometimes we use phone, email, but sometimes the kind of face-to-face -face chance encounter can be also very, very useful, okay? So we want to have that physical proximity with each other, okay? So implicitly, they are actually thinking about the design of office allocation based on this concept coupling and cohesion to decide who you want to be close associated with and, and consider part of the single module. Who you may want to um, have a clear defined interface so you would need to work with them, but, um, but you can manage that relationship without too much overhead. Got it? Okay. So this can be very, very useful, not just for software design. Okay, when you're dealing with a major project with very complex set of the task and function you need to implement, tasks you need to work on, think about this uh, design um, principle, modularization, and low coupling and high cohesion. 
Got it? And another challenge that we're facing, uh, this is a little bit more technical, but let me just briefly describe it. A lot of time you're working on a project, just like you're working on your group project right now. Um, and you, you do want to t we do want to test it as soon as possible, integration test. Okay, we'll talk about testing a little bit later. But a lot of time people will say, hey, I, I'm waiting for you to finish before I can do my part, right? Or, and so it's almost like everybody's waiting for each other. Okay, so everybody's blaming each other for not being able to do their, their job. This is your, this is one way you can solve the problem. I'm working on this module. I, I am, um, I, this module too rely on something being done here in this module in order to, for this management module to pass that information down to me for me to finish my job, okay? But this one is not finished yet. How can you test this module once it's done? So you don't have to wait for this module one to finish. You can create something called stub. Okay, stub here means, it's almost like a dummy implementation or quick prototype implementation of this module one. For instance, I need a random number to be generated by this random number generator to be used in my module, okay? So uh, one way is you just find a simple random number generator function to do it. The other is you just always generate a number, like 0 0.6. Okay, it's not randomized, but unless you generate a number, there's a number return, and you just use it to test certain things, okay? See whether that will work, okay? So you don't have to wait for each other. And sometimes the management modules um, may be missing and you can just create a driver so that you can just, instead of doing a lot of checking here, you just basically pass whatever pass to you back down to module two for them to do their job. There may be some more complicated business logic need to be implemented, but you can kind of ignore that and just doing the parameter passing, uh, perform that function, okay. So um, this is uh, this approach of creating those stops and driver allow you to do integration tests without waiting for everything to finish. Okay, the worst thing is like I have to wait until everything finished before I can do the testing. No, you don't. Okay, for more than day testing, you don't. Through this approach, you're able to um, to achieve. Okay, and this is just for your. It's kind of my interest, and I, I like the statements here. When you're thinking about design, design, t um, not just software, design any major um, artifact, um, it, it's all about thinking in the abstract. We call it abstract thinking, okay? Um, in the higher level you go, the more abstract it is, you say, um, if you want to design a software, you can at a very high level and say, I want this module to be able to handle the customer's order uh, to store in the database. Okay, it's, it's a pretty high level. Okay. In the very detailed level, you have to specify like what, what data has to be entered, what business logic has to be checked and the process and which database and where in the database you need to put the data and, and up, keep it up to date. Okay. So, if you think in the abstract, um, it, you can actually t um, come up with a conceptual design which are pretty generic, which can be more useful, which can be independent from the detailed technical things. Um, however, too abstract, your design would be useless. But if you jump into a very detailed documentation or design, then your design may not be very reusable, useful. So when you try to document your deliverable, either your requirement or design, try to keep the right level of abstraction or detail um, where it's most appropriate. Okay. In the early stage, it's more abstract, and in the later stage, it's much more detail. Okay, the last we're going to talk about is testing. Okay, after design, you implement it. We're not going to talk about programming in this class, but it's the testing. 
testing, you actually go through different stage of testing. Unit test, I'm writing a subroutine or function, and you can test it yourself. If you find some bugs, you fix it yourself. Usually programmer will do it. Integration test, you actually will um, basically put together different module functions together and test it all together. And this is where you write those stop or driver, okay, that I mentioned earlier. And if it's any error, then you try to resolve the error. Um, because sometimes it could be the driver's problem, it could be some of the module's problem. Regression test means that if you fix some of the problem in some of the module here, you need to actually go back and retest a lot of things. Um, I mean, if you've ever done programming, you find out sometimes you fix one problem, and you create another problem, okay? Because some of your fix has a bug in it itself, okay? And that's called regression test. Load test, loading test means um, performance test, okay? Systems performance. You try to um, test the system while it's fully loaded. What does the fully loaded mean? Fully loaded means that uh, for instance, you expect you can handle a thousand users hitting your website. Then you try to at least simulate that situation. Okay, a thousand concurrent users using your system to see whether you still have the um, performance that you expect to have. Okay, uh, the the load test is also called stress test. Okay, it's more about the system's performance. And sometimes you will fix certain bugs, and sometimes it's just fine tuning your infrastructure, your servers, and maybe getting a high speed, uh, high performance server, uh, better hard drive with high performance access time, etc. Okay. Last, not the least, is platform test. Platform test means for web application, it could mean different type of browser. Does it work on um, Internet Explorer, uh, Chrome, Firefox? And what version of the system that it works on? Um, does it work well on iPad? Um, it's um, the, the web browser on the, on, on the iPad, etc. Okay, that's called platform test. Okay. So this, this slide basically explains those testing again and I want you to review it yourself okay this slide describe the what does regression or regression test mean okay I pretty much explained it earlier but this is a formal um, definition of, of regression and regression test okay we're very close come to the end here now um, Software project is much difficult to manage because a lot of things are invisible. That's why you need documentation. We, we need to have this so-called life cycle approach. Whether it's through um, a spiral model, uh, through um, um, other approach, um, you want to uh, manage your project such that you can prevent some of the failure. The common reason for project failure is do not understand the requirement. Requirements are unclear, missing. Okay. And second is you're skipping some system development life cycle phases. Okay. Even you're using spiral model, you use quick prototyping, you're using um, there's another method called Scrum, S-C-R-U-M. It's another agile and modern day lightweight methodology. You're still kind of going through this planning, analysis, and design, and implementation phase, and sometimes multiple times very quickly. Another value may be due to fail to manage project scope. Scope somewhat reflect your requirement, by the way. Okay, so these two are kind of related. There are two type of um, problem here. One is called scope crip. The other is called feature crip. Um, scope crip just means you keep increasing the scope without controlling it. Okay, like scope or cripping up 
okay on people the, the user may say oh can can you add that um extended so you will cover this and you just say yes then you the scope has been increased feature can you add this feature or function um into the system okay the scope creep feature creep basically just means the, the scope will be enlarged um, and and then without adequate review without revising your schedule or your resource okay failure to manage your project or your project plan properly and sometimes it's due to the changing technology if you're not paying attention to the underlying time technology use it may affect your project's uh, success or failure uh, this is just a detailed slide document, uh, similar things, okay? Uh, so review it and make sure you understand it. So on the flip of the coins, um, on the other side of the coin is um, what are the successful principles for software development, okay? Just highlight a few. It's not uh, a complete list, okay? And particular for agile software development. Agile um, like Scrum that I mentioned earlier, um, that is, is an agile software development methodology. They don't go through the traditional waterfall model. They use more or less the spiral model. And in, in this case, don't allocate too much money or budget to the project. Give it, a, allocate the budget in, in phase. Finish this. If the analysis or this first prototype looks good, I'll give you more money to continue. Okay. If you give someone like a $1 billion to build a huge project, then th the problem of not being able to finish become your problem, not their problem. They already got your $1 billion. Okay. Um, so, so allocate the budget kind of step by step. Okay, just if you ever have experience of remodeling your home, don't give the contract all the budget all at once, at upfront. Okay, only say, okay, you need this for material. I'll give you this to buy the material. Or you work for three days, I'll pay you for what you have done in the last three days. Okay, if you give all the money, they have no incentive to come back to finish. They can just, they have, they want to get other new projects to make money. Okay, they just, when they have time, they come back and do it. Okay, when they have time, okay, because they got all your money. Okay, this is lesson learned. If it doesn't work, kill it. Always re review the risk and the challenge and decide when there's, it's worthwhile to spend more money to finish it. So you're constantly justifying the project. Not just say, we're going to do it, this is the money. No, you actually say, do this, if it looks good, at the end of the first run, I'll give you more money to do the second version. Okay. This one is very important. Keep requirements to a minimum. Okay. You need to identify what is considered the essential requirement, the requirement you have to do. The requirement, if you finish and implement it properly, the user have to pay you. Okay. And that's the what we call minimal requirement. Okay. And a lot of nice to have requirement, you can document it, but you shouldn't focus on them um, before you can take care of those minimal requirements. Test and deliver frequently. Remember that stop and driver concept. With that we can put together all the module even it's not totally finished yet and to test the final system you don't want surprise you want to do the integration test as fast as soon as possible okay and sometimes you do want people who are not the it executive to manage the software project which means potentially you will be the one maybe assigned to managing an it project because project management is management it's not software it's not technology and sometimes people who with strong technology background are so involved in the technology side, they lose sight of the project management related issue. Okay?